Okay, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Dov Shamir, Senior Manager of Entrepreneurship for Mount Sinai Innovation Partners, and welcome to our Pitch Challenge 2021. I'd like to take a couple seconds to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, McCarter & English, Alexandria Real Estate, and Alexandria Launch Labs, as well as One Seven Technology, and our, new, our newest sponsor, First Republic Bank. Also, a shout out to our partners at the ICANN School of Medicine, as well as Sinai Biodesign. And MSIP is a, pro a proud provider of AWS Activate. I also like to give a, a couple seconds to acknowledge and thank all our lecturers, advisors, and mentors. This is uh, some, some of which um, sampled here, um, who provided everything from workshops, um, seminars, provided you know, extra office hour support to our entrepreneurs and innovators throughout the programming throughout this year. And we really, we couldn't have done this program as well as we did without you guys. So kudos to you and thank you for your time and effort on everything. Thank you. My computer's working, there we go. And we have a very, very special announcement today. Um, our launch of Elemental Labs, which will be a Mount Sinai Health System virtual incubator program. This will serve as a launch pad for groundbreaking technologies from healthcare startups. This will create a symbiotic relationship with startups in this program and the Mount Sinai Health System, where Mount Sinai will provide various resources and inputs to help propel those startups uh, to the next groundbreaking levels of their technologies and platforms, which will hopefully help change patient lives and improve healthcare um, as we know it. This program will be focused on external pre-seed and seed stage companies um, that are looking for the next, next, next stage of financing and want to strategically align and grow with the Mount Sinai Health System. Uh, the corner tenant of this program will be um, the matching or pairing of a Mount Sinai champion in a specific uh, clinical or scientific discipline with that of the startup. And that same champion at MSIP will work with the startup to navigate and align within the health system uh, to work with individuals to help um, to, for, to figure out if you know, there's a path towards collaboration or further co-development of those technologies within the institution. Uh, there'll also be additional networking and educational opportunities, um, best practices to uh, essentially create and integrate technologies within a healthcare system and how to implement those solutions um, more broadly. Um, we're gonna be accepting applications on a rolling basis up until September 30th. For more information, please visit our website or email us at elementallabs at mssm.edu. This is um, part of a broader, um, I would say entrepreneurial programming of, from our group at MSIP. Our participants today, our finalists have been part of a, almost a year long program starting with our entrepreneurship boot camp, which started around August, September time, which forced them to go in a little bit of learning the fundamentals of uh, entrepreneurship and commercialization within healthcare and biotech. Um, they then went on to the tech launchpad in the spring, where they focused on positioning their science and solution um, so they can get in front of strategics and investors and other people who can essentially help them move their technologies forward. Today's pitch challenge is the capstone event of all of this. Uh, where there'll be three prizes at stake, a $25,000 um, cash grand prize uh, for future research and development in, of their technologies and solutions here at Mount Sinai. Um, McCarter in English is gonna be providing a $5,000 pro bono startup services prize. Um, and One Seven Technology will be providing a pro bono services um, worth $2,000 in uh, tech development strategy. Our finalists um, that in, in previous cohorts have gone to do some great things, everything from creating new startups, finding, finding follow-up funding, um, you know, filing of patents, um, licensing, of, uh, licensing of technology, and even uh, participating in nationally acclaimed and regionally acclaimed incubator and accelerator programs. Today, I want to take uh, about five minutes to hear from one of our uh, alumni in, our, in the 2019 Pitch Challenge, Retina Technologies, which has been really revol revolutionizing the diagnostic space of ophthalmology. And uh, we're here today with Alex Serafini, one of their founders. Alex? Hi, everyone. Let me just pull up my screen. All right. Hi, everyone. Don't have too much time today, so I'll try to get through our updates and a little background on Ret Tech. Um, I'm an MD PhD student at Mount Sinai and four other med students and I co-founded this company to create an end-to-end -end solution 
um, that actually provides quantitative vision screening as opposed to more qualitative screening you see today. Uh, just to quickly go over the issues that we see in this environment today, we see that a quarter of a million people approximately um, end up having minimal vision or blindness in the US every year. That ends up creating quite a substantial economic burden on the US alone. The issue is, is that 80% of these vision cases are theoretically preventable. Um, but because we have such a disparity in terms of a lack of vision specialist workforce across several counties in the US, uh, it's often difficult to find these conditions early on. Um, some of the reasons why we have such a dearth of vision specialists is that it's expensive and it's, it's, it is a very specialized field. So here you can see several machines that are necessary to actually operate a vision specialist clinic for everything from visual perimetry tests to retinal imaging to uh, the measurement of the thickness of the retina. And they're incredibly expensive. They can cost up to $150,000 combined. They require skilled technicians. Um, that with all of these combined tests can take between 30 and 60 minutes and fatigue patients as well. Um, so overall, it's not necessarily the most efficient way to get people to get their vision checked. What we're proposing is a platform called VMOD. It's an end-to-end -end solution that leverages novel modular technologies. So basically, we've been working with Sinai um, to develop a harness that is centralized and can actually aggregate data from a variety of interchangeable modules. Here we have an example of a VR module that's good for visual function testing. And we're also developing a miniaturized retinal camera module that can also be attached. And this allows you to really get a new sense of multi-dimensionality uh, of data that can be analyzed, right? Because you're capturing all of this data from the same device, from the same angle relative to the eye. And we're trying to keep it cheap so that we can actually integrate into uh, locations like primary care and internal medicine. Just a quick preview of how our business model would look. It's really a land and expand model. Uh, we keep it cheap so that you know internal medicine providers can acquire it. We've heard that 10K is really the ceiling for acquiring new technologies in that sector. But then we wanna make sure that we're actually a stable company and we have a source of recurring revenue. So all of, our all of our tests have been designed with existing codes in mind so that these tests are billable. And basically we'd work with all of the, uh, our customers essentially to help them with billing and actually aggregate a 10 to 20% fee based on how often they're using um, the technology, what types of tests they're providing. So just based on some back of the envelope modeling, this would basically give us 750 uh, per visit per patient. Uh, and it depends on the module you're using. The nice thing is, is that we're working with Sinai to try to integrate our platform with their billing system and their IT workflow so that we can really get ahead of the game and make sure that we're successful on those fronts. And we'll be aggregating a lot of data. So down the line, we hope to actually um, be able to sell a lot of the data or license it to third party analytics firms. Quick updates that we've accomplished since our 2019 pitch. We have completed our virtual reality examination uh, designs, and those are all currently in clinical trials. For retinal imaging, we've designed a retinal camera in collaboration with Synopsys, uh, an optical design firm out on the West Coast. Uh, with more capital, we hope to build out the first prototype. In the meantime, we've developed pretty good computer vision algorithms against a, a publicly available diabetic retinopathy um, data sets. We've tried to leverage our relationship with Mount Sinai to really actually make these efforts translational. So we completed a TOSIS trial, which is eyelid droop for those not familiar with the field, um, to validate our perimetry algorithms. And we did so far, based on our analysis, meet non-inferiority against gold standard technologies. That manuscript's being drafted. And we're currently having the largest clinical trial for virtual reality functional exams to date um, at New York Eye and Ear. That's underway. Um, early data looks pretty promising on that front. We also recently were approved for an IRB uh, to get over 10,000 uh, patient uh, files essentially from New York Eye and Ear so that we can actually train our own proprietary machine learning. And that'll include everything from retinal images to comorbidities um, and other crucial demographic information. Uh, since we started, we've raised over $300,000 through grants and our uh, pre-seed A round. Uh, including groups like Harvard Business Angels and New York City Media Lab. Um, and we're also currently working with different government organizations to try to enter different SBR spaces, um, such as the Air Force and the NSF. So we're working on that. Uh, just a quick shout out this summer, we hope to open our next round, which will be a 500K to $1 million convertible note. 
Um, we would love to talk to any potential investors um, or even technically minded individuals that want to get involved with our work. Uh, and here's reach out to us by my email. Um, we'd love to see you on LinkedIn and Twitter as well. Um, and thanks for the time. Hope you guys enjoy the rest of this session. Thank you, Alex. And with that, I will now shift things over to our judging panel. Um, Nishta, Lily, and Rachel, if you guys can introduce yourselves briefly, and then we're gonna get into our first pitch with Bedboard. Nishta. Great, thanks so much, Dov. Really great to be here. Um, very quickly, I'm Nishta Rao. Uh, I run the Life Sciences Vertical um, for First Republic Bank. Really, our aim is to help companies uh, such as the one that we just heard uh, to really grow and develop their operations. Um, really excited to be here. Uh, love being part of the MSIP ecosystem. It's very near and dear to me uh, and look forward to, uh, to this uh, session. Lily. Hey y'all, um, my name's Lily. I'm a principal at Collaborative Fund, which is a uh, early stage venture fund based in New York, um, or at least founded and, and grown up in New York. We've been around for about 10 years now. We're on our fourth fund. Um, we focus on seed investing and it's a pretty generalist mandate. However, we are relatively thesis driven. Uh, so uh, divide the team between four categories. Uh, those are health, FinTech, food tech and climate tech. Um, and I lead our healthcare practice. For the most part, we're focused on healthcare delivery and IT, um, but have been dabbling a little bit more into computational bio and chemistry platforms around drug discovery and drug design. So uh, that's us, glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, and Rachel. Hi, good afternoon, Rachel Stillman. I am currently an investment associate at Seven Wire Ventures. We are a digital health focused early stage venture capital fund located here in Chicago, as you can see on my background. Um, and we're investing pretty acutely in a thesis that we call the informed connected healthcare consumer. So for us, really looking for solutions that you know, not only have a consumer facing element to their platform, but ideally equip individuals with technology, information and data to ultimately become better stewards of their own healthcare journey. Um, currently investing out of our first fund, um, we are typically focused on Series uh, A investments, but we'll go a little bit earlier or later, depending on the opportunity, um, and really thinking about how do you bridge together the ecosystem of payers, self-insured employers, health systems such as Mount Sinai, um, and pharmaceutical organizations as a mechanism to reach consumers at scale. Really excited to be here today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and. Just before we go on to bedboard as our first pitch, um, just a reminder that our judges will be picking um, the, you know, the winners of the three prizes I mentioned before, and we will be providing those, uh, I guess, the, the final results tomorrow afternoon. So um, George uh, from bedboard, if you can uh, just share your screen. All right. We can see it, go for it. Excellent, thank you. Um, like Dope said, my name is George Fullard. I'm the founder of Bedboard, um, which essentially is a platform for hospitals to optimize patient capacity by utilizing a market-based approach. So kind of a novel approach to the problem, and I'll uh, sort of take everybody through it. So the problem essentially is that hospitals often run in excess of optimal capacity. Um, generally, 80% is considered sort of optimal, uh, where you have enough uh, patients in the hospital so that, you know, you're not uh, wasting money with the lights on, but you're able to move people around to ICUs or step down units or whatever the case may be uh, without sort of getting gummed up. Uh, the, a lot of times we see though, you know, particularly in the case of COVID, um, a bunch of patients coming in all at once, that uh, capacity gets pushed up in the 95, 110, 150% range and uh, makes it much more difficult to care for patients adequately um, in a safe way. Patient satisfaction suffers. It's really a, you know, a tough situation for hospitals and patients to be in. Um, you know, like I said, sort of this capacity strain comes from things like excess demand, so too many people coming in at once, uh, but also uh, results from not being able to get people out on time. So we think about sort of medical discharge delays of people who get sick right before they're about to go home or stay sicker longer than expected. 
um, but also non-medical discharge delays. I'm going to get into more detail on that in just a moment. But the essential sort of issue we're dealing with is that hospitals need to be able to expand capacity on an as-needed basis without having to build a whole new building uh, every time things get busy. So uh, that's kind of where we're starting. So taking a deeper look at these discharge delays, it's important to keep in mind sort of throughout this discussion that uh, reimbursement to the hospital for a given admission is fixed regardless of length of stay. So if you think about someone coming in to get their gallbladder taken out, uh, you can sort of figure about $15,000 in reimbursement for that hospitalization. If they stay five days, if they stay 50 days, um, reimbursement is fixed. So the longer they're there, um, the more costly it is for the hospital and it starts becoming a money losing proposition for the hospital uh, rather quickly. Um, you know, in particular, these non-medical discharge delays, we sort of think about patients who, uh, you know, they're waiting for a ride home. Sometimes that takes hours, sometimes that takes days. Uh, they're waiting for insurance approval to go to a nursing home or visiting nursing services to their own home. Uh, patients, families approving a particular rehab facility. So all these sort of like administrative, bureaucratic, non-medical issues that get people held up in a hospital longer than they should. Um, in particular, though, patients bound for post-acute care facilities, so rehab facilities, nursing homes, uh, long-term acute care facilities, home with visiting nursing care, they get tend to get held up more frequently, which makes sense. I mean, it takes more to get people positioned to go, more paperwork, more parties having to come together to agree on you know, how that discharge should look. So this is a, a really sort of um, uh, high-impact population in terms of these delays. So the scale of the problem is massive. Um, there are about 8 million inpatient hospitalizations in the US per year that are bound for these post-acute care settings. Like I said, rehab facilities and nursing homes and whatnot. About 2 million of these hospitalizations uh, result in delayed discharges. So again, a very large number. Uh, it's about a 50% higher cost of hospitalization for delayed patients versus on-time discharges. And you know these delays cost hospitals uh, nationally about $62 billion a year. So like I said, it's a massive problem. So the solution is to find temporary placement for these delayed patients at nearby facilities with excess capacity. So it does a couple of things. Number one, you know, you protect patients from the impacts of delayed discharges. Being in a crowded facility with suboptimal nursing ratios, you know, falling, getting sick, sort of all these sorts of things. Also patient satisfaction, which has an impact on reimbursement. The overcrowded hospital with a hospital under strain is able to free up capacity for incoming patients. So you get people out of the ER more quickly, you get people out of the uh, post anesthesia care unit more quickly, improve satisfaction for those patients, you know, better care for those patients as well. And the receiving hospital is able to utilize this spare capacity to generate revenue where they hadn't you know, been generating the revenue before. These sort of fallow beds can now be put to use. So sort of taking a closer look at the implementation here, you know, the first part is you identify a patient for enrollment. So case management or the medical team says, hey, look, we've got a guy healthy, ready to go home or with visiting nursing care or ready to go to this rehab facility, but there's some issues with paperwork, family approval, whatever it is. You know, we'd like to sort of enroll him in this program. We then go to that patient. We say, you know, look, here's how it's going to work. We're going to keep you informed the whole way. We're going to keep your family informed. This is going to be something that's going to benefit you. Um, but really putting that patient at the center of the whole process, getting their buy-in. Uh, patient and some sort of key characteristics are then put into our system. Um, so that allows sort of, you know, possible accepting hospitals to evaluate how much do we think it's gonna to cost to care for this patient, for how many days, what's the risk of that, you know, ending up being a little bit of a longer stay. Uh, what are the sort of financial intricacies of that transfer? Uh, and then matching the accepting and the sending hospital um, based on, what people are willing to pay and be paid for accepting this patient for a short amount of time. We then hand that patient back to the case management and the patient is transferred uh, by the hospital to the accepting facility. So the market, like I said, about 8 million inpatient hospitalizations per year discharge these post-acute care settings. 20% resulting in delays is about 1.6 million discharges in this cohort. Uh, if we could capture 15% you know, of this, it's about a quarter million transfers per year, so sizable. Kind of expanding that to the business model, uh, we think maybe subscription fee and then percent commission per transfer allows us to sort of uh, plug in the IT infrastructure of the hospital, get set up, service the account, 
and then uh, generate revenue based on a transfer, keep the system running. Um, you know, we think about sort of average reimbursement per transfer patient. This can vary a lot, but about twenty thousand um, dollars. Average transfer payment to the accepting facility about four thousand dollars. A twenty percent commission across a quarter million of these transfers is about two hundred million dollars in revenue, sort of a full clip. The other sort of component of it is that, like I said, we have to provide some characteristics about each patient to the accepting hospital so they can make a risk evaluation or financial decision about accepting this patient. So we start to generate patient profiles, um, some historical data about how long these patients are and where they are. Uh, so there is, I think, an opportunity for additional revenue through data licensing and analysis of that information. In terms of competition, so no one is doing exactly this. Um, no one's tried exactly this. Uh, Discharge delays are hugely costly. A bunch of people have tried to sort of attack it. Um, case management platforms like Careport, which is purchased by all scripts, allows for uh, case managers to help patients make decisions about where they're going to go, transfer their information, not really changing the amount of capacity you have at any one time. AI bed management software, a lot of people have tried this. Um, another sort of version of this is General Electric built a, a, a sort of command center for Johns Hopkins. Um, obviously, it costs a lot of money to do that, but the, I think they disclose about 16 extra beds of capacity system wide uh, utilizing this sort of approach. So, it doesn't move the needle a ton when you think about you know, a 1,200, 2,000 bed system. Um, and then, discharge lounges, and this is kind of the, the idea here is to build a, an extra facility to accept patients who are stable just for a short amount of time until they can be discharged. Um, the issue there is you have to build a facility, uh, you have to staff the facility. This is costly for you know a number of reasons and doesn't allow you to flex um, sort of on an as needed basis. So in terms of near-term development, initially financial analysis to identify sort of target patient population, really narrow it down. I've got that I think nailed down. I'm happy with sort of the first um, patient population to try this with. We then sort of are now in the let's pilot study phase um, with some strategic partners. So ideally it's Mount Sinai and another nearby health system. Uh, so we can sort of work out some of the, you know, the kinks, so to speak, see where the sticking points are, uh, see if this thing will work, and then simultaneously develop a prototype. So that's what allows the hospital systems to sort of make these decisions, submit patients, communicate, sort of market um, the brokering component of the system. Looking further out in terms of you know, scaling up, developing the platform to be uh, you know, a full-fledged uh, business, sort of 12 to 18 months uh, to get us where we can generate some real revenue. Product designer, a manager, uh, four engineers, a business analyst, and then legal and other expenses, about $1.25 million should get us there um, to where, like I said, we're generating some money. In terms of leadership right now on the team, officially, it's just me. Um, I'm a, right now a diagnostic, soon to be interventional radiology resident. I see patients all the time who suffer from this uh, sort of delay issue both in terms of people stuck in the ER um, or people trying to get home. I saw a guy recently who I spoke about last time who had spent three days in the emergency room without a pillow, sharing a bathroom with about 200 other people. Um, and the, I think the wait time to get out of the ER was 72 hours. So high impact problem, really benefits patients and hospitals alike. A um, couple of great advisors. Austin is a you know, big startup guy and is really, really understands the space and has been a great resource to me to, understands sort of how to put something like this together. And then uh, Chris is a trader and has some great insight on how to build a marketplace from scratch, which is really, I think, what we're doing fundamentally. So summary of opportunity in terms of what we're looking for here. So financial partners, investment to get us sort of to the next step. Again, pilot study, prototype for the actual software interface and market making capabilities or brokering capabilities. Uh, advisors and collaborators, so people who are familiar with the space, um, case management, hospital finance, and sort of post-acute care. Those sorts of things I think are really important in this case. And then institutional partners, like I said, ideally it's Mount Sinai and another nearby health system. Uh, so we can pilot this thing and figure out how to you know, really take it full scale. Again, helping hospitals to find temporary placement for these patients um, who are bound for post-acute care settings. Uh, we're gonna improve patient outcomes and satisfaction, uh, which is great for patients, great for hospitals alike and optimize hospital resource utilization and throughput and sort of the way that I described. That's what I have. Um, I'm obviously happy to take any questions and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with everyone today. Thank you, George. Uh, 
judging panel. I'll, we'll start with you, Rachel, or, or Nishta. Who, yeah, I'm happy to kick us off. Yeah, uh, go for it. Great job, great job. Thanks so much, George, for the thoughtful presentation, very clear. Um, I, I think I have a more broad question. You know, how are you getting health systems comfortable with the concept of um, potentially discharging patients too early? I know you talk about the ROI case, right? But there's some meaningful financial implications with you know 30 or 90 day readmission rates. Just curious, are you guys providing the risk analysis, or is this a pool of patients that have already been, you know, deemed eligible for discharge but just don't have a location to go? Maybe help help me understand kind of the how you communicate that to your buyers. Yeah, of course, that's a good question. I think that um, I ideally I, there is an opportunity to do a risk analysis, you know, to build a, a system where we're doing a risk analysis and helping hospitals with that sort of decision. I think initially, though, um, you're you're approaching patients who are ready to go, lower risk patients. And, you know, you kind of think about um, hip replacement patients, for example, generally healthy surgery um, is straightforward, done at scale, and these people need to go to rehab. So I think that it's, you know, you start with stable, less sick patients who are approved for discharge. Uh, we're not making that decision for hospitals yet or helping with that decision quite yet, but that's certainly something that could be approach them in the future. Got it, that, that's helpful. Maybe one question and then I'll, I'll kick it off to the other uh, panelists. So, so who within the health system is is using the platform? And as you think about kind of the, the tech stack, is this a web-based platform that's integrated into their existing systems? Maybe help me understand the, the tech point piece and where this fits in the workflow. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, the sort of target user is the case manager. They have, I think, the best view of patient flow through and out of the hospital. They use tools like I kind of I mentioned, Careport, that are similar to this. And um, I, medical teams probably aren't the right users. It's just not something they normally deal with. They tend to be try to try to be as hands off as possible with this sort of stuff. So I think like web based interface, um, case manager users is sort of your target. That's kind of I think where we want to sit in the the flow. Got it. Very helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Just a quick question for me, George. Um, fantastic presentation. Uh, just wanted to understand a little bit on how quickly this information is uh, refreshed. Is this happening in real time? Because you want to make sure that, you know, you go to a place where there are beds, right? So how how does that happen and what's the time frame? So the in terms of, you mean, like the accepting hospitals, their bed availability? This is actually kind of an interesting challenge and something that I've spent some time thinking about. I think the sort of easiest way, like on the pilot end of it, is that you have accepting hospitals be like, well, we're willing to kind of offer, we have, let's say we have 60 empty beds, we're going to put up five beds and we're going to try this with five patients, sort of start on a limited basis. Um, but it is kind of an interesting challenge to think about how you start to aggregate regional hospital capacity. You know, and how that changes over time and how that changes over time asymmetrically. Obviously, you don't want it's not going to work so well if all the hospitals get busy, then all the hospitals get slow. Um, and sort of getting hospitals to buy in to submitting that information in a way that's semi public um, is an interesting challenge. So, I think though, to answer your question more directly, uh, initially you have sort of hospitals designate a number, a certain number of beds as their bed board eligible beds, um, and they would do that manually. And however often, uh, I'm not really, <laughs> not exactly sure, um, but they would do that manually initially. And then sort of in the future, look at like, how do we make this more of a, a real time live market? The interesting thing about the live market is that, you know, you think about like, well, it's, if we could save a day or two, that would be really valuable to a hostel, but it ends up saving hours on discharges. When you think about how, you know, a single hour over across thousands of patients across hundreds of days, um, is actually really valuable too. So I think higher frequency data eventually would be useful as well. So I don't know exactly how to do that yet, but um, that's where I'd like to end up. Thank you. Thank you. Lily, do you have any comments? Oh uh, yeah, I, I just, great job, George. Uh, I think the only question I have is following up on what Nisha was uh, I think getting at in terms of liquidity of the marketplace, I think that is the right analogy here. And I think, um, especially because it's going to be high frequency, like very variable transactions, it's good for marketplace. There's not a lot of risk that I think 
you know, one hospital is going to form like a bilateral relationship with another hospital and, and get off the platform, which is really interesting. But I'm curious, uh, typically when we work with marketplaces, supply is most important um, and you need a, a, a decent amount of supply to ensure liquidity to make it valuable to, uh, uh, to the demand side in this equation. So I'm curious if you have done any thinking around how many hospitals in a certain region or density or a certain profile you need to bring on before you can really run a uh, effective pilot um, or if you could imagine doing it with just a couple. Yeah, I, could, I guess I'd be curious kind of to go to market on the supply side. It's actually, I, that's probably one of my favorite questions to think about is it's, it's kind of uncharted. Like I said, no one's really tried it before. How do you kind of model that? Um, I think there are two ways to sort of look at it. The first is, you know, are we gonna be a broker? So we're gonna off, we're just gonna set up a marketplace and allow hospitals to buy and sell their space, um, or do we want to be a market maker? And I think in terms of like secure, like making sure liquidity is sufficient for a pilot, market maker maybe makes a little more sense. I haven't quite figured that out yet, um, but the idea is that we would go uh, actually purchase bed space at another facility. Uh, and then offered into the market as opposed to allowing okay. it. So yeah, and I don't I don't know what the right answer is necessarily. I think it's what something that needs to be worked out with the pilot study, really. Um, which again I think can be done with a couple hospitals. Um, but in the market, you know, maker sort of model, we go and we buy, um, you know, a number of bed days. Like that's kind of where you get it. Come up with bed days um, from Montefiore or whatever it is, and then we like try to, you know, move those around and sell those to the busier hospitals. I don't, know the right, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think that is one solution to the, to the liquidity issue, at least on the front end. That makes some sense. Thanks, George. Thank you. All righty. Thank you so much, George. And uh, we now move on to Virtue. Um, I think, is it Gary or um, Sophia that's going to be projecting? Uh, Gary. Gary, go for it. You can see it. All right. So I guess we'll just start. <laughs> well, I'm Sophia. And I'm Gary. And we're the co-founders of Normal. We're here to show you how we're working to democratize the power of machine learning to reestablish a new normal. Our intuitive platform utilizes machine learning and AI for event planners and venues to safely assess and manage crowds at social gatherings that have the potential to create super spreader events. So we have to stop living in the cycle of panic and neglect that happens with every new disease outbreak. This pattern plays out over the years despite countless warnings of scientists. Thus, a lack of a comprehensive approach to reopening has led to premature relaxations and unnecessary spikes in cases. Even though we're nearing a grand reopening, experts are warning us again that it's unlikely that the US will reach herd immunity on its own. This is exactly why our platform is aimed to help us get back to a safe new normal. For example, let's look into a real case with my friend Diana, who had to cancel her 2020 wedding due to COVID-19. She is hesitant to reschedule for 2021 in fear of exposing her loved ones. But Diana isn't alone. A survey of over 2,000 people revealed that 96% of couples are considering infection prevention to be a very important factor in their wedding plans. There is an immense emotional guilt surrounding Diana's decision, but our platform can give her the peace of mind and begin to redefine a new normal. Normal aims to facilitate larger contract agreements for event venue managers and event planners to increase their revenues by three times the current levels, all the while mitigating costs of pandemic regulation liabilities. The value we provide will maximize economic gains, prevent super spreading events, and ensure that our customers retain a positive image in the face of so much uncertainty. Normal is designed to utilize the power of machine learning to create COVID safe events. Upon creating an account, Diana's event planner can register a wedding by providing basic information about her venue and party. They'll answer straightforward questions that proactively assess the safety of the event and give suggestions on how to make the event as safe as possible. Once the event is registered, the event planner can monitor key information affecting the event's safety. On the right, we see how many have registered for the event through our companion app, as well as those that have been tested already. The left shows how safe the event compares to the minimum and recommended goal, and she can see any safety notifications her venue may have for her. Our team is confident that by accounting for all the variables that affect a person's transmission risk, 
not just vaccination status, will be able to provide safety levels above those provided by state regulations. Now, when Sophia gets Diana's invitation, and hopefully me if, I, if she gets a plus one, she can download the app, verify her identity, input her COVID relevant records, and receive a dynamic normal score. She too will receive recommendations on how to improve her score and be less of a risk to others. She will have this peace of mind not only before her wedding, but also after Diana's wedding. They both will have access to post-event information of attendance and achieve normal score, along with important updates if she was in close contact with someone who has fallen ill after the event so that she can get tested immediately. The live event industry is struggling to acclimate. As separate entities, our direct competition provides insight without solutions, runs off a narrow definition of safety, or doesn't directly address the needs of the live event industry at all. We come in and fill in the gap between these two industries by providing proactive advising, personalized risk scores, data analytics, and ultimately enabling strong partnerships between these segments through our API integrations. Normal is classified as an event management software in a global market valued at 14 billion. This total addressable market can be further segmented into the US serve available market of crowd management systems, where we calculated our share in the market as infection control software. Within our beachhead market, we will capture 1% of New York private events revenue with potential earnings of 1.5 million our first year. Subsequent years will feature expansions geographically, share of the market and acquisitions into larger market segments within the crowd management software industry including um, customer segments in the commercial events industry that include conferences, concerts, and someday soon, maybe we'll catch a full crowd go wild at MetLife Stadium. So we have to ask the question, how are we going to make a profit? Well, we begin by offering a subscription service that provides tailored and up-to-date regulatory information. For the ability to access our normal scores and progress tracking tools, we will utilize a pay-per-use model that charges on the base, based on the size of the, and complexity of the event. Ultimately, we want to maintain user engagement, so of course, attendees will be free. As we continue to grow, we will utilize, um, we will <laughs> sell our proprietary data and utilize API integrations, as Gary mentioned before. So our team journey began at Mount Sinai via the Thrive Fellowship Program and through MSIP, through the subsequent MSIP programs that Dove explained earlier. Here, we were exposed to experts in pandemic response, and from here, we also grew all of our ideas. Even though our first idea was a no-go, we remained motivated and sought out new problems still left to be solved. Which brings us to the beginning of 2021, where everything just kind of exploded. Our initial iteration, we won few small competitions and invested 3,500 of our prize money on branding and front-end development. We interviewed over 30 potential customers in the private events industry, identified our customer archetypes as safety-conscious large-scale event planners or large-scale event venue managers. Our end users are individuals who are health conscious, but not averse to some risk. We found early evangelists who are excited to try a service to lessen their workload and increase their business, especially after the hardest year of their industry. Next, we will plan to expand our interviews as soon as July to reach 100 plus individuals as via the NSF sponsored ICO program to further validate our customer segments, explore pricing tactics and expand beyond private events into the much larger live and corporate events industry. Now, for the spice of what makes us unique in the crowd management space, we are starting our agile development with a pilot study of a 100 person event aimed for the summer. In the short term, we have a three month funding goal of 50,000 to fully develop our MVP and initialize our pilot studies. We calculated a projected cost for app development to continue our research studies and employ new team members, which is a big figure to keep in mind as we reach an inflection point of our timeline. To minimize the risk of, invent of investment, we plan to accomplish everything prior to this point to make the most knowledgeable go decision as we possibly can. After accomplishing all of the above, we scale up our data acquisition while in parallel partnering with local health agencies to increase capacities of our studies and also increasing capacities for our customers, which is a major pain point affecting revenues expressed from 100% of our interviewees. Within this phase, we'll initiate necessary IP strategies, attain larger seed funding to cover our projected costs, and accelerate our growth in our customer ecosystem. Next, on the startup creation of our year two, we will have the funds to scale up our product along with our team with additional funding. 
The beauty of a software platform such as ours allows us to tap into a beachhead market so quickly because this need and demand are high in a space that has never existed before. As the saying goes, if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, which is exactly the advantage we have in the space as we expand nationally. This projected growth within our third year is entirely possible with the right funding where you come in and the implementation of our marketing strategy. The key strategy at this point in year three is to integrate our APIs into the online sites of big ticketing companies like Ticketmaster and Eventbrite. This quick growth is again possible because people are itching to get back to normal all over the world. At first, as first in the market, we have a dedicated user base, a trusted service, and a noteworthy repertoire that will gain the attention of health policymakers, events, industry leaders, and lay users across the globe. The potential of such an expansion also opens the door to monetizing our proprietary data and the big data we have collected over the years. And it serves as a massive competitive advantage if we expand into other areas of crowd management and diversify our marketing plan. Wow, seeing our timeline laid out like that really illustrates our growth. We won pitch competitions, we developed our front end design and branding and illustrated customer discovery and initiated customer discovery. Currently, we're validating our customer segments, pro product market fit, and preparing our technology for upcoming pilot studies. As we run those studies, we'll be simultaneously acquiring our first customers for the paid service. So to conclude, I am excited to introduce our team. As the founders of Normal, we are composed of a diverse set of researchers, clinicians, and entrepreneurs involved in various spaces of healthcare and research. Furthermore, our advisors are seasoned innovators that have been taking charge since the onset of the pandemic at Mount Sinai Hospital. Our team understands that it's time for a new normal, a normal defined by valuing our loved ones' well being as much as we value their presence, a normal that utilizes adaptive technology to safely bring us all back together, and a normal based in data shared for the safety of our communities. If you have any questions after the event, feel free to contact us as we pave our way to a new normal. Thank you. Okay, judges. Uh, Lily, maybe we'll get started with you. Sure thing. Uh, thank you all so much, uh, Gary and Sophia. It was really uh, great to hear y'all talk through. Um, I'd love to just spend a little bit more time um, better understanding exactly where the product is at today um, and the roadmap in terms of how you're gonna develop it over time. Um, I know you you mentioned pilot studies you need to conduct, but yeah, we'd love to spend a little bit of time on, on where the uh, where the project is at today and, and how y'all are thinking on bringing on folks to help build it out with you, whether that's engineers or UX designers, whomever it may be. Yeah, so- Definitely. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> we're both excited to answer that great question. Um, currently we're um, developing protocols with, and getting um, the appropriate um, what are they called again, Gary? The appropriate, sorry, my Spanish is kicking in, but um, to go through IRB, and then we also have to go through um, a COVID commission, like COVID related um, research um, things. We're also going, we also partnered with an epidemiology um, professor who is serving as our advisor to submit these IRBs. And um, we also have one of our other advisors has like, enlisted us to be able to conduct, um, not necessarily a study, but just to initiate feasibility studies on deploying our MVP. Um, and then uh, we're also getting um, certifications for COVID related um, event management. Um, there's this, a bunch of these things um, came popped up and we found out about them via our interviews, which is really interesting. Um, and then, yeah, we'll be definitely recruiting as soon as possible for data scientists, but we do have on our team a reputable data scientist, Tiffane Martin, and she serves um, as a leader, not only in Mount Sinai in data science but, and artificial intelligence and <laughs> big data, but also um, internationally. She's originally from France, and so she serves on one of those boards. So. We're really excited about attacking all these areas. <laughs> it seems like a daunting process, but we're very excited nonetheless. And adding on to like where we are today, we spent a lot of time sort of going through the design process so that once we do have that data scientist and um, app developer that they basically have the entire framework to make it um, as is running here. And 
it's a machine learning model. So these pilot studies are going to be what we feed into it so that we can push through. Awesome, thank you. Just one follow-up question on that. Uh, something you mentioned, Sophia, that there are like uh, increasingly certifications around COVID safe event planning. I'd be curious if, um, yeah, the extent to which you see folks kind of uh, coalescing around one and there's one standard and, and, uh, and that's how you build the product or at this point, yeah, I guess curious how you build the product to those standards if it's evolving over time, given it's such a- yeah. At this point, according to I'm sorry, according to the um, interviews, they're they're very different across industry segments. So in like private events industry, they have certain um, standards to follow. Some of them don't make sense to a lot of people, um, and they don't translate into other industries. For example, the restaurants um, they're able to operate kind of in a more riskier level, but the event private events industries can't. So um, the regulation is very stringent. So what we're trying to do is simplify that. Um, and then again, with the COVID regulating or the COVID um, compliance officers, things like that, they, they're kind of from what we've viewed, it's still kind of um, an overview. It doesn't really get deep into what we're trying to do is like figure out which factors have to be weighted heavier. Um, and it's not only on just the the people side, it's also the venue side. So we're taking into account the physical space and applying that to our model. Awesome, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Super Rachel and Nishta, we have uh, time for two quick questions. Great, uh, just a couple of quick questions for me. I was just wondering if you had an idea as to where all of this data is gonna be stored, how it's gonna be stored, how is it gonna be protected? Uh, and the second question is, have you thought about, okay, this is great for COVID event planning, but is there anything else in the pipeline, say from two or three years from now that you're also looking at? Mm -hmm. Gary you can cover the, the security stuff. He's our tech lead, so. <laughs> yes, so as far as that's going, um, we're looking to use the same standards that have been used for things like the Excelsior Pass as far as like making sure that we're pulling validated data from all of these sources, as well as following the same high tech and HIPAA um, parts for something that you might think of like uh, Apple Health, let's say, as far as all of the, these different um, pieces of information that we're pulling. Outside of that, there's some data that you might have noticed there related to like loca location which has, again, its own set of standards if you're um, taking into account different um, location data. So there's a lot of standards that have been put in place and most of the ambiguity has been worked out for the sake of other solutions to the pandemic. And there are a lot of different regulations for that, but we will need these servers and all these um, um, like physical um, spaces for that data. As far as storing data, we'd we'll be utilizing cloud-based storage. And then on top of that, um, following HIPAA compliance. And it's actually getting increasingly easier, especially with the transition into Firebase um, public um, personal health records. Um, we actually attended a, a whole consortium or a whole like um, conference about that. And so it's definitely feasible. Um, and the second part of your question. We got excited with the first. So <laughs> what was the second part? Just, you know, what what else are you looking at in terms of, you know, the pipeline other than event management? So actually we looked into, so because we'll be collecting a lot of other data, especially into the future when we ha have a huge, um, and we expand nationally, um, we can go into the crowd management space, especially because um, according to what we're looking at is we're looking at, um, social dynamics, right? So the way people are moving in spaces, how they're getting into enclosed areas, um, bottlenecks of crowds. And this translates into a space outside of just infection prevention where we can basically model um, and predict and, um, and predict factors that might initiate crowding um, in certain areas. And um, that basically can go into any events or large, um, large scale um, congregating type um, scenarios. Thank you. Rachel, do you have any last thoughts? I, I have questions, but keep me honest with time. I can pause uh, if we're, if we're one, up on time here. One really quick question. Great, okay. 
Um, can we talk a little bit about the competitive landscape? I know you guys mentioned you guys are the only ones in the market. We, we have seen others, I think, albeit taking a bit of a different approach. So mm-hmm. we'd love to just, just get your thoughts there. Yeah, Definitely. so far, go ahead, Gary. So as far as our competitors go, like there are parts of us that are like risk calculations. And as far as um, the way we differentiate ourselves there, a few of these risk calculators focus on both the attendees and the event and aggregate them together to determine whether or not the people there are actually risky people in the space that they're in. As well as places like Excelsior Pass, that was what I was saying where they had a narrow definition of safety, where even though they have this recommendation, if you um, keep it um, tailored to only a vaccination status, there's a large group of people that are not going to um, either fit that criteria and can't um, actually reacclimate or re-enter um, many of these events, whether it be for their own personal reasons or the large population that just can't be vaccinated. Um, so right now we don't have a lot. A lot of these competitors aren't accounting for the fact that there are these different regulations that aren't fitting with the a large portion of the American population. And it's also important to just note note that we're implementing not only epidemiological science, data science, and and, um, into a space that really hasn't utilized it before. So um, there's, yeah, (laughs) I don't want to go over time, sorry. No, I appreciate that. Thanks, thanks guys. This was very helpful. Righty, thank you all. Um, And next we have Root Identity. Bola, you're up. not letting me share my screen. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, I can share your screen if that's helpful. Yes. I can share screen. End of portion. You'll just let me know which, you know, which when to move the slide, okay? Okay, got it. Okay, we're just opening up. I'm sorry everyone for the technical difficulty. I'm not sure what's going on. There we go. Okay. Okay. So we are Root Identity. We are a national initiative focusing primarily on CCCA, which is a type of hair loss disorder. Let me skim over to the next slide. So I want to tell you guys a brief story. And as I do, feel free to look to your right to read about some of the women's stories who suffer from this condition. And these are actually from women that we've reached through the initiative thus far. So I'm going to tell you guys my brief story. It's about my godmother. Um, and my godmother's name is Sade. And she is a 56-year-old African-American woman. And she has a general mistrust for physicians. She does not like going to the doctor's office. But one thing about her is she will never miss her appointment with her hairstylist. She will be there. She will be on time. She will be early. And about a year ago, she went to her appointment with her hairstylist and their hairstylist told her, hey, you're kind of losing some hair. And my godmother became very distraught. She started looking on Google to figure out if there were any sort of remedies she could try. So she tried oils, she tried different steaming treatments and alas, she realized that she couldn't do it by herself and she needed help. So she went to her family um, doctor who told her that hey, yes, you do have some hair loss, but I'm not sure exactly what type of hair loss it is. So I'm going to have to refer you to a dermatologist. It took months. It was a very lengthy process, a very confusing process. But finally, my godmother got into a doctor's office, a dermatologist's office. And by that point, the dermatologist told her, you have CCCA or central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia. And she was told at that time, unfortunately, that the hair loss that she had suffered was irreversible and permanent and that there was not much that she could do to salvage her hair. Now, I wish that I could say that this story was unique to only my godmother, but unfortunately, this is a story of 4 million women in the United States of America right now. 
The problem is that women with hair loss are not getting diagnosed, and when they are, it's often too late. And that's due in part to a really difficult process from those at the front line of our community and medicine, which are our hairstylists and our primary care physicians, to our specialists or our dermatologists. The second problem is the comorbidities that are specific and linked to CCCA are not being treated because people are not diagnosing CCCA, which may lead me to my last point. People are not diagnosing CCCA because they don't know it exists and there's a lack of education of this disorder in our community. So the solution that we propose to these problems is the formation of a digital platform. On this platform, we're going to send to all of our groups, which consist of primary care physicians, hairstylists, dermatologists, and patients. The education is going to be tailored to each of these groups. Now, for a hairstylist, that looks like learning about what CCCA is and how to recognize it, and knowing how to speak to a patient who has this disorder. For the patient, that looks like, why is this happening to me? And learning more about what CCCA is and what the causes are. We are also going to be connecting all of our different groups. For the patient, that looks like having access to a forum where she can talk to other people that suffer from this condition and she can get some comfortability from people who walk this journey already. For our primary care physician, they will be able to have a patient that they see that suffers from hair loss and quickly and easily refer that patient to a hairstylist that's knowledgeable in styling hair affected by CCCA and connecting them also to dermatologists that have um, expertise in diagnosing and treating CCCA. And we also want to have at the fingertips of our providers and our hairstylists, a technology that will allow them to quickly diagnose CCCA or increase the suspicion of this disorder. And this is going to be through the use of an artificial intelligence technology where patients, where providers will be able to easily take a picture of the patient's scalp and it's gonna take inputs such as um, peripheral, um, perifollicular erythema or honeycomb network, things that are specific to CCCA and it's going to compute the percentage match to CCCA. Now, what we know is that there is a need for an app like this. And we have a lot of data supporting this fact. We also know that by 2050, 50% of the United States population is going to consist of skin of color patients. And this includes women of African descent. This means that the prevalence of this disorder is projected to increase, which means that demand for an app like this is also going to increase. So what does this look like? This looks like my godmother, when she found out that she had hair loss, getting onto an app and creating her CCCA care dream team. So she can find a dermatologist who can diagnose the disorder for her. She can find a primary care physician that can treat those comorbidities linked to CCCA. She can also find a hairstylist that knows how to style this hair. And this is all within one platform. And she also has access to the education in that forum. This looks like for a hairstylist, for instance, once my um, godmother got into her chair, being able to whip out this technology and take an, um, a picture of, the, of my godmother's scalp in order to diagnose CCCA and her streamlining that patient to a dermatologist instead of it taking months like it did for my godmother. For PCP, that looks like also getting um, access to reaching a dermatologist quickly instead of having that long, lengthy referral process. So the market for our um, this technology is actually vast. Currently, there are 30 million women in the United States that are suffering from hair loss. That means 30 million women who don't know what the next step is. And there is a potential for this for us to expand this market because we can use this technology in not only CCCA, but possibly other hair loss conditions and other cutaneous conditions. So the market for this is really um, um, plenty. So our leadership team consists of a powerhouse. We have those with business expertise. We have those with CCCA expertise, and we have former hairstylists. We also have um, on our team um, those with technology and teledermatology expertise, and we have a software and app developer on board. 
And I think the most important thing is we're all very passionate about providing the women who suffer from this condition the care that they deserve and providing them quick and easy access to it. So our fit business model is going to be a monthly and annual um, subscription system for both our providers, our hairstylists, and our patients. And we are going to have our product cost $29.99 per month and $300 per year for, again, patients and providers. And our goal within the next year is to reach 10,000 users. And with this, we, have, we are projected to um, receive about $3 million in, in revenue. So for our competition, most apps right now that are available either serve primarily as a resource or a directory. There isn't an app currently that does offer people that are very crucial to care in hair loss conditions. And that's where, that's where we come in and that's what we do best. So our business timeline looks like within our first quarter, we want to actually create the prototype for the app and we're looking for $130,000 for that. Um, we've currently found five hairstylists that are willing to test the app for us um, whenever we finally have the app. Um, and with this, we are currently having more hairstylists that are signing up every day to actually test this app for us. We've also created an education committee that is helping us developing that education that will be tailored to each of our groups. And we've also found a developer that is ready to get to work and ready to start building the um, artificial intelligence technology and also developing the app. In our second quarter, we want to reach an engagement of 10,000 people, and we want to have a total of $57,950 total for this quarter. We want to use reaching the engagement of 10,000 by having pilot sites and didactic sessions that are going to be primarily targeting dermatology residents and um, primary care physicians. And at this point, we also want to continue developing the app. In our third quarter, we want to actually roll out the app. We also want to have a conference where we're going to really speak about minority health in general. So that means it's going to target our providers, our hairstylists, and our patients. We also want to utilize social media platforms in order to continue in our advertising efforts. And we want to, again, release the app and meet and analyze the data as necessary. In our final quarter, we're looking for $10,000. Um, we want to reach an engagement of 250,000 people. And one of the ways we hope to do that is by having um, going to a few of the hair shows that have a large uh, population of African American women. And we also want to continue our advertising efforts and meet and um, update our app as necessary. So currently we've re we've done a lot so far. We've actually found the developer, like I mentioned earlier. We've also found an image database that we're going to use to train our artificial intelligence technology. And we've been awarded $15,000 from the American Academy of Dermatology to be put toward the education content. The content is still currently being made and it's going to be done within the next month. We've also created a website um, and an Instagram account where we've gotten a lot of engagement from people that have been um, using it. We've also reached an engagement of over 1,000 people through Reddit, Facebook, our Instagram account, and our blog, and through Head Start. So for our partners, we have wonderful internal and external support. We have Head Start, which is really our foot on the ground. They are connecting us with women who suffer from this condition every single day. We also have the Skin of Color Society that is assisting us in creating the education that will be um, placed on the app. So for our finances, we're looking for $221,900. And we want to use that within the next year to reach a goal of 10,000 users with half of them coming from patients and half of them coming from providers. So in total, we really want to meet patients where they are, whether that be in a hair salon or at home or in a doctor's office. And in order to reach our goals, we're looking for $221,900 to do so. Thank you all for your attention today, and I welcome any questions that you have. All right, judges. Nishita, we can start with you this time. Great. Um, thanks so much uh, for that presentation. Just out of curiosity, I mean, so what do you think the compliance is going to look like for this app? Like, okay, you know, younger people maybe, but older 
older individuals that maybe are not tech savvy? Like, how do you how do you approach that? The users or the providers? Users. Users. So this condition actually affects mostly women, older women. So it's 50 to 60 year old year olds. And I've reached out to a lot of them through their Facebook. So I've spoken to hundreds of women who actually have this condition. And one thing I can tell you is they want an app like this. They are looking for an app like this. So the want is there. And because within their, their community, hair is such a big, important part of our identity. And which is like my godmother, she was, as soon as she figured out her hair was lost, she started looking up everything. So I think if anything, access to information like this all in one platform, they're going to be ready and willing to have an app like this. So I don't think there's gonna be too much of a problem with compliance that they'll be receiving from it. Thank you. Thanks so much, great presentation. Um, I think maybe one element I'm struggling with is a little bit on market size. So I know, you know, initial market sizing exercise was conducted more broadly across all women with hair loss. Just curious, you know, what does that market look like for women with CCCA? And is that, you know, big enough to, to build a business in this space? Yes. Yeah, so currently there are 4 million women with CCCA. But we expect, we actually believe that that number is um, lower than what is being reported because, again, people don't know that there's disorder out there. So the level of suspicion is very low for it. So the market is likely bigger than what we see. And what we also know is when we develop this technology, there is room to grow to other hair loss disorders. CCCA is very close to my heart and very close to the team's heart. So this is something that we initially wanted to use as a stepping stone. But definitely there are many other hair loss disorders out there. There are many other cutaneous disorders out there. So the potential market is much greater than 30 million. Got it, very helpful. Um... And then maybe one piece, you know, as you think about go to market, it, it looks like there's, you know, kind of five, four to five key stakeholders depending on how you look at it, right? That can all be brought into the ecosystem from hairdressers to dermatologists, PCPs, patients and the like. How do you think about prioritization as you kind of ultimately get the app in the hands of the consumers? Is this something that you want to go detail providers to then refer to their patients? Do you want to go D to C? maybe talk to me a little bit about the strategy there. Yes, so we want to reach each of the groups individually really. And we hope that once, you know, they have the app in their hand that a provider will then say, oh, hey, by the way, there is, you know, this app and they can suggest it to the patient. But initially we are reaching the patients directly and that's through the hair show, for instance, we're gonna go directly to them and we hope to have at that time that app to show to them at the hair show, like, hey, look how much easier your life could be with this app. For the patients, for the um, primary care physicians and the hairstylists, we're, all, we're meeting all of them where they are. So we're gonna meet the primary care physicians at the didactic sessions. And at that time, let them know here, this is app technology for you. And you know, for the hairstylists going to the hair shows, they'll also be there. And I think the important thing is in order for, you know, there to be the CCCA care dream team, they need to all be on the app. So we have to prioritize all of them Although this is all for the patient, we have to make sure that they have access to that hairstylist and that PCP and that dermatologist. So we're attacking all of them um, at the same time through different um, methods. Excellent, Lily. Uh, final thoughts. Yeah, I think I think y'all covered it, and I think you did a great job walking us through. Um, I think the only other question that I would have. Um, or I'd love maybe a little bit more clarity on is just um, on the patient population themselves, the extent to which, um, or I guess like how many cases would you imagine you could catch uh, once hairstylists are trained? Um, or are there, is, are there going to be certain folks that just present in different ways and are going to be really hard to diagnose or going to be, uh, uh, or they're going to be, they're not going to present in the way that you would imagine? And yeah, I guess maybe talk a little bit about if there are any patient populations you don't imagine being able to treat with the app or if it's and with the platform in general, or um, if you think it really 
is a fit for basically anybody in, in your target population with CCCA? So I think that is honestly a hard question to answer because the data is already underrepresented. So we don't know exactly how many potential CC people who have CCCA out there. We have 4 million that are diagnosed, but potentially a lot more that we um, don't know. And there aren't studies happening on this within medicine. So we're really also going to be con um, contributing to the medical literature and being able to tell them, hey, you know, we initially thought it was 4 million. Actually, it's 50 million. So we're also helping in shedding light in this area that isn't getting a lot of um, recognition currently. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Fola. And uh, now, uh, Charles, you're up with Gilgamed. Charles, we can't hear you. My apologies. <laughs> so, we, we were able to see your screen. Yes, um, yes, that's again. great. So let me get back to the screen. Okay. All right, uh, good afternoon. I'm Charles Mobs. Allow me to introduce Gilgamed, a company I founded after studying for 30 years the mechanisms linking age to age-related diseases and particularly the mechanisms by which dietary restriction delays age-related diseases. The plan was to work out the mechanism, put it in a pill and save the world by eliminating age-related diseases. As you can see, the plan hasn't quite worked out, uh, but we made enough progress that I think we can now proceed to leverage our discoveries to discover drugs to treat age-related diseases. Hence, Gilgamed, uh, which is based on a proprietary drug discovery platform that's focused on discovering multi-protective drugs that promote healthy aging. Uh, you might wonder about the name. You probably know that in the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh tries to find the fountain of youth for eternal life, fails to find it, and realizes the purpose of life is not to live to forever, but to live the best life you can. That's the animating principle of Gilgamed, hence the epic of Gilgamesh has led to the ep ethics of Gilgamed. So uh, we're gonna focus on one specific age-related disease today. Uh, the problem is Alzheimer's disease, which is America's uh, costliest disease. Last year, it cost uh, the American health system and economy about $500 billion. And it's expected to, um, costs as much as a trillion dollars uh, by 2050. Every American alive right now has an estimated lifetime risk of about 40% uh, of developing Alzheimer's disease or related uh, cardiovascular or vascular, cerebrovascular uh, dementia. Women are, uh, have twice the risk as men. But the good news is delaying the onset by as, perhaps as little as two years could reduce lifetime risk by as much as 50%. So we don't have to cure it. We can just delay it to have a major impact. So that's the problem. So what's the solution? Well, obviously, the drug companies, uh, this is a huge commercial opportunity, and they've been working very hard to discover drugs to treat Alzheimer's disease. But as everybody knows, uh, those efforts have completely failed. So what are we doing that's different? Uh, well, the way, the modern way to discover drugs is based on identifying a putative target, often purifying the target, doing a screen for drugs that bind the target or inhibit its activity directly or indirectly, carrying out efficacy and toxicity studies in uh, animal models, and then moving on to clinical trials. That's how the uh, drugs that were tested by the uh, pharmaceutical companies were discovered. Um, and... Uh, Obviously, after billions of dollars spent on clinical trials, this approach completely failed. So what are we doing that's different? Well, we have a completely different approach, uh, which is based on phenotypic screening. So we're focused just on essentially the symptoms that we're looking for. Now, that requires some ingenuity to focus on the right symptoms, but we have developed high throughput screens to do that. Um, there's a lot of skepticism about phenotypic screens in the drug discovery business. It seems a little unscientific, but actually all major first and 
class drugs were discovered by phenotype. Uh, penicillin is a famous example, but I could give you many, many others. Uh, so we think that history is behind uh, the validity of phenotypic screens. We're focused on two main phenotypes, TNF-alpha secretion, which has been implicated by many different lines of evidence as driving pathology in Alzheimer's disease, and A-beta toxicity. Now, the drug companies are fo focused on A-beta peptide, we're focused on the toxicity. We think that toxicity shares in common mechanisms with other forms of toxicity, for example, produced by PTAL, that no doubt also contributed to Alzheimer's disease. So those are the two main phenotypes we screen on. Um, and then once we get very uh, promising drugs, we do secondary screens in a mouse model of stroke and also lifespan stroke. Um, has many mechanisms in common with Alzheimer's disease, major problem on, on its own, obviously, uh, and it's much faster to screen. So we initially start with that. We screen for lifespan because all drugs have off-target toxic effects, and we're looking for drugs that we know have overall protective effects, even if it might have some off-target effects. We're focusing on Drugs that have multiple protective effects, it seems like a tall order, but we've managed to discover lots of drugs like that. And we focus on small molecules uh, that we believe will penetrate the brain after oral delivery. There's a lot of technical things that we do to um, get to the final stage of synthesizing novel compounds. Um, I'm happy to discuss those at the Q&A if you're interested. Today, I'm just going to focus on one uh, molecule that we've developed. We have a lot of potential molecules so far, but I'm, I'm going to say that this molecule, uh, GM310, we call it internally, is our top hit so far. And if it goes so far as to be approved for Alzheimer's disease, who knows, we might call it Gilgamem. So this molecule has all these protective properties in one small package. It inhibits microglial TNF, decreases A-beta toxicity, penetrates the brain after oral delivery, concentrations that are effective, protects in a mouse model of stroke, increases lifespan, and out of the blue, turns out also blocks SARS-CoV-2 replication. I'll talk about why we did that study uh, at the end, uh, but it shows the richness of our uh, phenotypic screen platform. So what are the commercial prospects for a small molecule that blocks TNF-alpha um, secretion? Well, the most profitable drug in the world, all it does is block TNF-alpha. That is the uh, monoclonal antibody Humira. The only thing it does is it blocks TNF-alpha, most profitable drug in the world. Uh, and as you can see, the sales are approaching, uh, have actually exceeded $20 billion. But the, and it's, so it's great. It's approved for rheumatoid arthritis and many other age-related uh, inflammatory diseases, but it does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So we believe that uh, our drug is actually in a position to compete with Humira, certainly for Alzheimer's disease. So I'm very quickly going to go through the uh, data. Uh, so first and most important, our compound inhibits microglial TNF-alpha, which as I said, is implicated in driving Alzheimer's disease. It's a really remarkably effective inhibitor. Uh, this is baseline levels of secretion. This is uh, stimulated. And uh, at the higher doses, which are not that high, uh, it, it almost completely inhibits a TNF alpha secretion. As far as I, I don't know of any other drug that has that property. Um, and so that by, a lot, by itself is very promising. As I indicated, it also independently delays um, um, A-beta toxicity in an in vivo model. This, the readout here is paralysis, but it's A-beta toxicity, and it, it, it protects at levels that would translate into an oral level of about 30 milligrams per day, which is a very uh, typical and plausible do dose. Penetrates the uh, brain after oral delivery at levels that are far higher than necessary to produce the uh, protective effects, and it increases lifespan. So at very low levels, uh, so that suggests that if it has uh, toxic side effects, the protective effects, this is not even an Alzheimer's model, it's just in wild type, uh, clearly dominate. Uh, so we took our top three compounds in this uh, series, uh, 310 and two related compounds, and tested them in a mouse model of stroke. And as you can see, uh, all three compounds, but especially uh, 310, uh, preserved activity and memory after stroke. And again, stroke and Alzheimer's disease share many pathophysiological mechanisms. 
So, um, like I said, out of the blue, turns out that uh, GM310 blocks SARS-CoV-2 replication as well as remdesivir. I'll discuss why we did this study in Q&A if you're interested. Uh, but in addition to blocking replication, of course, it also has major anti-inflammatory effects and the um, age-related increase in um, mortality rate in COVID-19, everybody pretty much agrees, is driven by cytokine storms, uh, which GM310 is uh, well positioned to block. So, um, uh, what is the competitive landscape? The competitive landscape is uh, basically this is three fairly representative small biotech companies. They all uh, are addressing specific targets as opposed to our phenotypes. Uh, they're, they're, they're doing fairly well, uh, but as you can see, our uh, GM310. Uh, is protective in many different phenotypes relevant to Alzheimer's disease compared to these uh, drugs, not surprisingly. Nevertheless, they have market caps of, um, of over a billion dollars, more than two billion dollars in some cases. Uh, so we think there's a lot of room for uh, Gilgamesh in this space. Our uh, platform development, uh, we just founded Gilgamesh, so uh, this year we're writing STTR proposals for both Alzheimer's stroke and COVID-19. We're asking for $25,000 to do a cytokine array study and RNA-seq study on the responses to uh, GM310, which we think will greatly strengthen the, competi the competitiveness of these grants for these major STTR awards, $500,000 a year for each uh, indication, probably our first uh, grant will be for the Alzheimer's, so we'll test efficacy and toxicity for that indication. We'll hopefully then be moving on to COVID and stroke. Uh, that'll be 1.5 million a year. We think by that time we'll be ready for IND and clinical trials, which of course will be much more expensive. We'll need private funding for that, um, both for private investors um, and possibly from the, from the pharmaceutical companies. But there is a nice exit strategy for the investors uh, via acquisition or IPO uh, by 2027. So this is our dream team of really fantastically well-qualified uh, uh, people in the executive suite. We have many uh, scientific advisors. Um, and I just wanna thank everybody who got, it, got us here. This is my contact information. Uh, and um, this Epic of Gilgamesh has led to the Ethics of Gilgamesh. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Charles. Okay, judges, uh, we have, we're running a, a tight ship here. So um, if we can have some brief questions. I'll, I'll jump in. Thanks, Charles. Really well done. Um, Thank you. Won't pretend to know this space well, um, but I will. I will ask. Can you share, perhaps, kind of as you think about the landscape, um, what pipeline candidates exist right now that perhaps might compete with the solution, and how you're thinking about broader differentiation as it relates to mechanism of action, or, or how you're thinking about the landscape? Right. So I think, as I say, the the, the three. Um, uh, companies that I pointed out, I think, are kind of fairly comparable in their um, kind of approach and kind of the kinds of um, molecules that they have available. But uh, really, I don't, to my knowledge, there are no other small molecule or even large molecule candidates that have these two different separate phenotypes. Frankly, I was astonished that we were able to come up with drugs like that, uh, small molecules across the blood-brain barrier. So I really that's this is not the way anybody else is thinking and uh, so I don't think there's really any competition the only question is is it going to work in humans but that's going to be the problem for any drug uh, or for that matter is it going to work in mice so that's what we'll uh, you know that's that's our milestones if it doesn't work in mice we don't go any further but if it does clinical trials and it's just like we'll see I have to say though we have twice as much of a chance as any other drug because we have twice as many targets um, so that's kind of how I see the competitive landscape Got it. Helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lily, do you have any questions or comments? Sure. Just one question since uh, I, we didn't get to spend much time on it, but just if you wouldn't mind, Charles, walking me through a little bit on the team and, and how you think about complementing um, uh, with clinical expertise. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, thank you for asking that question. Um, I don't know. I, I don't want to go. I, we don't have too much time. So I'm just going to tell you, I'll just rattle off. So the uh, CEO 
uh, MBA from Wharton, and uh, was a director at Pfizer for many years. Uh, we're very lucky. She's just looking for greener pastures. We're very lucky to get her. Uh, so eminently well qualified. She spent much time in this environment. Um, for the uh, medical advice, we have an MD who's also a serial entrepreneur uh, and highly qualified for, she's also done clinical trials. Uh, we also have a, a person who's worked both in academia who had PhD in academia and in industry. So she also has a lot of experience. And then finally, we have a person who is uh, about to get her, she has a master's in MPH, but she's about to get her MBA from, an executive MBA from Columbia. And she has also be, been very involved working with the FDA in uh, development of uh, devices. So um, we have a lot of experience in, and of course, many of our advisors, uh, almost all of our advisors have gone through the whole FDA process. So um, they have expertise way beyond mine. Uh, I, so I, I think we're amazingly uh, lucky to have such a great team, frankly, at this point. So thanks for the question though. Bravo, thank you. And Nishta. Just very quickly, I mean, a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we can Thank you. Offline, I uh, was really interested to see that, you know, you, you are going after the stroke space, which is like really, really hard to uh, to get make any headway. So we'd love to talk a little bit more about that. But in the interest of time, uh, we can do that offline. I will point out that uh, one of my main advisors is Dr. Chris Kellner, who's run many uh, clinical trials on stroke, and he can't wait to get started. So, uh, but I'd love to discuss it with you. So please, uh, you have my contact information and Dove can set us up. And so I'd, I'd love to talk about it. But you notice I didn't pick that as my first indication. That's a, that's a tough business, much tougher than Alzheimer's actually. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Excellent. All righty, thank you, Charles. And, thank now, you. and uh, now we're on our final pitch, uh, Dr. Diana Kirk. Okay, uh, hopefully um, I've been able to successfully share my screen. Good afternoon, my name is Diana Kirk and it's a great pleasure to present to you all this afternoon and, and follow these wonderful pictures. I'm an ENT surgeon at Mount Sinai and I wanna to present to you 3D printing for type one thyroplasty, which is the first technology to emerge from my newly formed company, Laringa Tech or Larynx Tech. So the problem that I'm presenting to you today is that of vocal fold paralysis. This is a static image on the right side of screen. And I'm just gonna quickly orientate you before I uh, launch into the dynamic images, but this is the front of the vocal cords. This is the back, this is the right side, and this is the left side. And you can already see here that there is a difference between the two sides. Now, this will become more apparent as I launch into the dynamic images. Okay, say e, e, e. So you can already see that the left cord is immobile, the left vocal cord, it's not moving, it's paralyzed, and that the right vocal cord is moving and doing all the hard work here. Say e. And because of that, you can very clearly see that the patient can't close their vocal cords adequately. They have a hoarse voice and they also are at risk of aspiration of food particles down into the airway because they have this significant gap where normally there wouldn't be one. So what's the impact of this? It is clearly a significant problem. The reported rate of vocal fold paralysis is about 1%. Now that's 3 million patients potentially out there. We don't see all of those patients present to our offices because sometimes paralysis can return to normal function. As we have just seen, it results in hoarse voice. It can also result in trouble swallowing. This can subsequently lead to aspiration of food matter, which goes into the airway and can result in pneumonia and unfortunately death. The current solution to this problem is an operation called a type one thyroplasty. As you can see here, this is an image of the Adam's apple or the thyroid cartilage in cross section. This is the front, this is the back. This is reversed to the images that we just saw. And we currently create a little window in this thyroid cartilage. And through this window, 
we place a sizer, we measure the deficiency between the two sides, and then we place an implant, which is either Silastic or Gore-Tex. The placement of the material is a bit of an art form, and I speak um, from personal experience in doing this procedure. You take out the implant, you place it, you get the patient to speak during the procedure because they're awake for it. You take it out, you put it back in, and you keep doing this over and over again until you get the desired result. This then results in something that looks more like this. These are, uh, this is a stroboscopic uh, video or um, image of normal vocal folds. So you can see that the vocal folds are coming together much more adequately. They're joining in the midline and there's less of a gap there when the patient speaks. The solution that I propose is something that's a little bit more tailored to the patient. Rather than doing this guesswork and, and entertaining the artwork of surgery, I think we can actually analyze a patient's CT scan prior to going into the surgery, which is not currently done, and crafting a customized implant based on their preoperative CT scan. Without going into too much detail here, you can see an image of a paralyzed vocal cord on the left of screen. This is a normal vocal cord on the right of screen. And you can clearly see that there's a difference when you look at two normal vocal cords here. What I think we can do, and we're already starting to do this, is that we think that we can compare the abnormal side to the normal side, subtract the difference and create a customized implant, which will take away all that guesswork and lead to a more efficient uh, surgery. We've already started to model uh, the vocal folds um, with, some, uh, with some data that we've already got. And you can see here that this is a normal vocal cord, this is an abnormal vocal cord, and there's a clear volume difference between the two sides. There's also a clear height mismatch in the, the way the vocal or paralyzed vocal cords sit too. And this in itself can inform our surgical technique. So in terms of timeline, we're already up and running. We've had our initial IRB approved. Um, we're already moving into CT scan analysis and refinements. We are in uh, discussion with an external company in helping us potentially to refine the analysis that we've already done. We are also in talks with this external company to help us build our 3D template. Um, and they can also help us um, build this from the CT scans that we have analysed. We are then going to use our template um, to uh, insert into cadaveric laryngeas, which we have already harvested, and we hope to implant that in the coming months. And then we want to move into a human trial, and recruitment of patients, I think, will take no more than two years to end of study. The budget is actually pretty minimal. Um, a lot of the monetary expenses are currently uh, in-house at Mount Sinai and provided by internal funding. Uh, the staff funding is, is pretty minimal. The mobile auto recording and the thyroplasty implants, it all amounts to only about $25,000, but, but the potential of this is quite significant, I believe. In terms of volume, currently type one thyroplasty, according to the Part B uh, Medicare list, there were 1300 done in 2019. I'll go into a little bit about this more in a few slides, but the potential of this is, is more than that. The cost of the procedure is anywhere between 3,500 and 6,500, and the reimbursement is up to 2,200. In terms of competition, I think we add a lot of value into this space. In comparison to the traditional voice, uh, sorry, rather, in uh, comparison to the traditional products, I believe that the voice outcome will be um, non-inferior. I think it'll be about the same, but the benefits come in terms of efficiency. I believe that the operation will go from, currently it's about 90 minutes, it'll go down to about 45 minutes from um, incision time. Subsequently, that'll improve cost and overall OR time and efficiency. That in itself will lead to improved patient satisfaction because as I said, they're sedated but awake for the surgery. So the less time that you're undergoing a surgery while you're awake is, is much better. And obviously it'll lead to surgical satisfaction in that we can get through more cases in a day. 
these financials are very preliminary and I've really just based it on cost savings in the OR. For the first year, I don't really anticipate that we're going to um, develop any um, cost savings. But as we move into subsequent years, I think the OR saving time of cutting it down by uh, 45 minutes um, will lead to significant savings. They estimate that one minute of OR time currently uh, costs about $37. So as we continue to roll it out across the Mount Sinai Health System and double that every year across hospitals across the US and then worldwide, we'll continue to see this curve grow quite, quite rapidly. So the potential I think is where the benefit of this technology lies. At the middle of the, the diagram here, we have the CT scan analysis. Now it's a CT scan analysis that will eventually lead to the creation of customized implants but it also might be able to just simply inform surgical decision making and those that are a little hesitant to take up this technological advancement. It will also inform, I believe, in the, few that, in the future other implant procedures that we perform. And finally, we also do this procedure in a temporary sense in the office, and that's called in-office laryngoplasty. That clearly wears off the material that we use, and often it's a proof of concept in order to perform the permanent procedure. But I think it can also inform the volume of material that we inject in the office. And currently, there's about 3,000 of these cases being done a year. So in total, we're looking at 4,000 cases in the United States done each year. In terms of my team, it's really a small team. We've really recently just um, you know, formalized our name and our partnership. It uh, consists of myself, an ENT surgeon at Mount Sinai and one of my residents, Dr. Eli Kinberg. Um, we're associating with Company X, who I, I can't mention at this point, but that is also very exciting. Um, we think that this company will be at the forefront of other emerging technologies in this particular space. Thank you for your time. It was an absolute pleasure speaking to you all and listening to all the presentations today. I really welcome questions and feedback. Thank you, Diana. Okay, judges. Um, how about uh, Nishta, we can start with you. Great. Uh, thank you, Diana. That was fantastic. Um, just, you know, quick couple of questions from, from my end. How long would this implant last? So in a sense, does the patient have to come back in X number of years to either get a new implant or you know, how does that, that work? Uh, in terms of recovery, it seems that recovery is quicker um, for the patient just because you know, the time spent in surgery is, um, is, uh, is less. Uh, but um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But also uh, my question was, from the time that a patient comes to you um, and you know you see you, you have the primary evaluation and you're like, okay, I this is what we need, we need an implant. How long would it take to actually get from that point to getting the implant and doing the surgery? Yeah, so I'll eat, uh, address each of those questions. Sorry, there's like a lot, a lot of that. <laughs> well, I, think, I think I got them. Maybe you yeah. might need to remind me as we go on. But the, the first question, the implant is lifelong. Um, the current implants that we use are lifelong. Now, there is an issue with 3D printed silastic currently. It's not built for lifelong use. But I think that's going to change very quickly. So we're labeling this as a template for the moment and as a comparison to the current um, standard silastic that is used. So I'm not concerned about that at this point because I think that 3D material will soon be um, used in a lifelong sense, just as we do with the, with the current silastic and Gore-Tex. Um, to answer your first question. I believe your, your second question was in terms of time and recovery. The current recovery is about four weeks. They get a significant, you get an optimal voice in the OR and then following the OR very quickly, which is why you wanna minimize the operative time, they get significant vocal cord swelling. 
and the patient actually gets quite a tight voice. It takes about four weeks for that vocal cord swelling to come down. So I actually think that with the shorter operation to 45 minutes, that recovery may only be about two weeks. Um, and we see that also in the rhinoplasty space as well. The longer your operation goes, the more swelling they get. So that's why I think there'll be surge in inpatient satisfaction. In terms of your final question, it can happen very quickly. I would see a patient like this, if they hadn't had a CT scan, they would get that within the week and they could be scheduled as soon as two weeks. I base this concept on um, proprietary technology that Stryker uses for mandibular reconstruction, which I also do. And that's sort of what influence my uh, thinking about this product. When I'm doing that with them, the planning and the build of the material takes only about 10 days. So I'm hoping to get it to the same time frame. If someone needs it more urgently than that, then generally what we go to is a very short term injectable to bridge them to the permanent procedure. So they don't suffer, they don't aspirate, they don't get pneumonia, they don't die. Thank you. Lily. Yeah, just one quick question, being mindful of time. Um, I think you mentioned um, and walked through the, the financial resources that uh, you needed to uh, get through the next round of technical milestones, but curious just if you look a few uh, years out to talk through a little bit around the commercialization timeline. Um, yeah. Let's go. yeah. Such a great question. It's a little bit difficult in the world of ENT to create commercialization because the data on the impact of someone having vocal fold paralysis is not really there. The data in terms of morbidity, hospitalizations and pneumonia and death, it's not there at all. And I actually am currently doing a study looking at that to inform this further. Um, so in terms of answering your um, question, it's kind of hard to nut out the financials given that you have no precedence there in the first place. So I can't really yet come to an idea of how much we would charge, you know, to offer this, um, offer this, you know, um, this template um, for sale or even just doing the modeling. I would have to speak to Striker to see what they do with their 3D modeling for JAWS, et cetera, to see how they, um, um, create their funding or their, their charging structure. So it's it's very difficult. So I'm sorry to be so vague, but it's just an honest answer to your question, honestly. But I think the potential is great and uh, no one's really looking at it in this innovative way, which somewhat excites me. Not only could it inform this one procedure, but I think it could form a number of other procedures in my field. Thanks, Diana. That, uh, I appreciate the honesty with an early stage startup asking for like long-term financial projections is always asking for a guess anyway. So I appreciate hearing okay. you talk It's the Australian in me. We're very honest. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Rachel, final thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Um, Diana, I think I'd be curious to learn a little bit about, you know, what this looks like for the physician or the surgeon, you know, specifically does this change meaningfully kind of the processes in which you're completing a procedure? And then as you think, again, I know super long-term, right, but on the commercial front, is this one where, um, you know, you would need to build up a med device sales force and have actually, you know, representatives standing in the room, or is this something that's a bit more autonomous for, for the provider themselves? Yeah, so great questions. And I think I can answer both of those. I think uh, what we have seen as a result of our initial analysis is that already it can inform our current surgeries in this area. And that in itself might be a marketing point to those that are really resistant to, to letting go of the art of this surgery, which I think there is a great deal of. Um, and I can see that too. And with our, it's informing things that we haven't really thought about before in terms of how the vocal folds sit in uh, a different plane in more of the vertical plane, which we don't really address with the initial surgery. So um, to answer your first question, I think in itself, just the CT scan analysis can inform current surgeries um, and optimize those a little bit better. So there is value there. Um, in terms of your, your second question, I believe that was to um, having a, a force, a, a sales team. 
You know, I think that this could be done remotely akin to what Stryker does um, with their modeling technologies that you sit with a technologist on, you know, remotely via Zoom and you go through the case with them and you do, you do the CT scan analysis on that spot and you put it together and you go through the height and, and you know, you sort of mimic what a normal position of the vocal cord would be. That's how I envisage it playing out. So I don't think you would need staff on site. It could all happen remotely, which would save a lot of money as well. And then you would send the, the implant to them pre-packaged and, and they would get it re-sterilized. Makes sense, great. Thanks for the clarity there. Thank you, Diana. And, and that concludes our pitches. Um, thank you to our judges for your help with this today. We will be um, giving the results of today's pitch challenge tomorrow afternoon. Um, again, also thank you to our sponsors and partners as, as well as um, you know, everyone else who's been part of this programming for the year. Uh, we, could have, we could have not done it without you guys. So everyone stay safe and healthy and have a great Cinco de Mayo. Thanks, Dove. We couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> Thank you.